um, this idea of looking at something from multiple perspectives. Yeah? We do that in the Feldenkrais method by changing orientation a lot, changing position, but we can also do it in any position just by changing where the head's going. You know, just a small thing about where is my head going through space is a major change in orientation because it's going to, as I said the other day, it's going to stimulate the vestibular system and where the teleceptors are. So um, orientation is a huge part of how I like to work with people. So I always often come back to, you know, the, those three aspects of movement that are timing, orientation and manipulation. And how do we work with all of those factors when we're working with someone? So the manipulation is the movement itself, the organisation of the movement. The orientation to me is a lot how I'm orienting to the task. Where's my attention? How am I directing my attention to bring things to orientation? I'm always very interested in how people organise their heads and their ability to have different orientations within, within that that is absolutely dependent on everything underneath, yeah. on exploring lots of other things. And the timing. What's the timing someone needs? How do we vary the timing? Do they have a very particular timing? But anyway, so they're all things that you've talked about before. What I was going to do this afternoon was this is another perspective to look at learning from that we're going to talk about now. So I think I said to you early on, there are multiple perspectives about learning. Now, there is so much information out there about learning. There are so many great teachers in the world <laughs> that we can that we can learn from. And then it's getting clarity about and what are we doing? How do we teach learning? What are the things we're really interested in? And I just wanted to pursue this model a little bit about, um, it's called the three-story intellect. So it's a model of cognitive thinking. So it's looking at the intellect in particular and I think we can apply it to to anything, basically, our feelings, our sensing, and our moving. So what it works on is that there's three, there's different learning tools and strategies that we can use to uh, promote our learning, if we come back to what promotes learning. And the first one, and you've heard me use these words a little bit over the last few days, the first one's simply gathering information. I have to gather information to do anything with. No? So how do we gather information in awareness through movement? What, what are we directing people to do to gather information, no? to begin to notice things, to begin to uh, simply to sense themselves in many different ways? So and he puts, there's different words that you can use and some of these are really um, applicable to awareness through movement, some of them aren't as applicable. So words that they would put in at the bottom, so this is the house that's getting built. So the gathering words are what this, this calls the input. This is the input. You're gathering information. You're sensing something to make sense of, basically. So you'll get a copy of this, okay? But some of the words in gathering would be complete, identify, <laughs> recite, which is probably one we're not going to use quite as much. Let's recite the ABC. <laughs> define, list, select, describe, and observe. So they're just simply words. But the, the thing I'm really after here is we want to gather information. 
So that's what you've been doing in your process of doing ATM. You've been gathering information by paying attention to what you do. So the next step in the process is processing the information. So this is the area where you've got to start making sense of this information that you're giving to people or that you're getting to yourself. And generally what you tend to find is that the more things you notice, the more relationships you can begin to build. So when I was asking this morning about um, what do you notice that tells you that you're ready to teach? So there's a lot of ex sorry implicit learning in you. Huh? From all of these ATMs you've done, there's a lot of implicit learning that you just, you know, you could say to me, I just feel better organised. Huh? If you want to teach, you sort of have to take that, <laughs> I think, to another level of where you actually need to be able to verbalise the implicit into the explicit for the people you're working with. So, you know, I asked, asked and Gloria was really gorgeous. She said, oh, you know, I can feel my belly, you know, where I breathe down here and I can, I've got my ground. When I was looking at Gloria, I could see that all of her was in her image. Now, when she was demonstrating, oh, I breathe in my belly and I've got the ground, so she's got two things that she can explicitly bring to her attention in terms of understanding, making sense, processing all of this information that she's been putting into herself over the last years. So one of the things I really noticed yesterday, and I think um, you touched on it as well, is this ability in your ATM teaching to do this, to start building relationships for people. How do I begin not only to get them to notice, which is the first step, but how do I begin then through my language to get them to notice relationships, to get them to begin to process this information into something that's going to have a little bit more meaning? So what are some of the things that you can do there? So if I give you um, some, some good examples from other teachers. So um, Arlene Zones would always talk about, because she was asked to, why she was such a good ATM teacher, and of course she couldn't. She said, I can't, I don't know. <laughs> and I'd say, but what do you do, Arlene? You know, what is it that makes you such a good ATM teacher? So I sort of had to tell her a few things that I'd observed because she was so in the process, she was so in her thing that she actually didn't make distinctions about she, what was she was good at. We're all pretty good at that, at not making distinctions about what's easy for us. We're all pretty good at pulling up our weaknesses, <laughs> the things, because they stand out more. You know, they sort of, they're there in front of us. So what are these relationships? So she's, what she's really good at, if you ever listen to her, is she puts joining words in all the time. Can you feel as you press through your foot and your hip starts to lift and your weight starts to roll to the other side? Da-da-da. Yeah? So she wouldn't ever say, feel your foot pushing to the ground. What happens in your knee? Can you feel that's moving your attention in a different way if I say that than if I say, as you push into your foot, can you feel that your pelvis begins to lift, your weight starts to roll to the other side, and maybe you feel you get longer on the side that you're rolling towards. Hmm? So it's a, that's a really powerful way to 
begin to make relationships within the movement that someone's doing at the moment. Another great example, this was from Elizabeth Berenger, and this is a little bit in answer to your question or your comment this morning, Philippa. And Elizabeth, at the end of what might have been a very challenging lesson for people, usually big movements through space, would always come back and say, can you remember anything in that lesson that felt really delicious to do? <laughs> no matter how small it was, doesn't matter what it was, but something that felt aesthetically pleasing for you. And she will often get people to finish a lesson by doing that, by them having to again out of all of that that they've done, notice, 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 now let's process. Can you actually <laughs> remember what it was that actually just felt really good to do? And that's how you can end the lesson. No? So that's just another example of how you can... Um, getting people to notice, 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 but then your skill in being able to bring this into something that they're putting together all these bits. So they get the idea, you know, can you feel when something really feels more pleasant that more of you is involved in the action? That you can spread your attention more easily? So these are the, all the things we're trying to do in an awareness through movement. To, for them, they've, they've noticed things, but then we're trying to pull it together for them into this having a little bit more meaning within the context of the ATM. Does that, that make, make sense? So the words that we're going to use there, compare and contrast, powerful learning tool. As soon as you ask someone to compare and contrast, you're asking them to process on a different level than you are when you're simply observing or noticing. Yeah. Because they've got to have two different experiences that they're, that they're having to juggle together. Classify. Maybe not a word, but sort, distinguish, explain. So often, you know, it's really nice in context of an ATM and they can feel a really big difference at the end and you simply go, how do you think that happened? How did doing those movements on the floor allow you to do that more easily? So you can just set them up to ponder a little bit or to... <laughs> think a little bit more about can they begin to explain in a way what happened in the awareness through movement lesson that led to this that I'm feeling now. Um, sequence, we use sequence a lot because again there's a big difference isn't there if we're asking someone to time or sequence a movement and you start here and you go through there that's a very different way again of directing attention than if I'm staying with one part so all of these things are just devices to get people to begin to process this information the input that they're getting and you know of course it's always the quality of the input that's going to make the difference to what they're processing. Synthesize, make analogies, reason, you know this is where um, processing stories can be incredibly powerful, metaphors can be incredibly powerful, that you've got this experience, let's add it to some other things that make sense to you. Okay, so the last one's applying. And I think this is, as Feldenkrais practitioners, where we often fall down a little bit personally. How do we get people to make this meaning and meaningful and relevant in their normal life? How do we do that? What is it that 
they understand and maybe it's implicit for some people it's implicit they're really sensate people and they get up and they have this experience and they go that is fantastic i'm coming back <laughs> it just makes me feel good to to do feldenkrais awareness through movement there's some people who aren't that sensate so how do we address their needs how do we come in in different ways to get them to process the information in a way that has more meaning for them that's more meaningful in their lives so applying is the really big one for me you know where you really getting someone to really begin to transition or transfer the learning so let's do something really concrete. I love concrete. So lie on your sides. Or on your back. Doesn't matter. Any position. And you've just been doing this wonderful awareness through movement lesson. Huh? Really enjoyed it. So even as I say that to you, how much can you find that in yourself? How much can you go, I know what Julie's talking about when I say, remember <laughs> what it felt like to have done an awareness through movement lesson and that, again, what are the components that make us feel good? Any lesson you teach that includes more of the person in their image of the movement and gets them maybe to shift their attention in a non-habitual way is going to make a difference. To sense themselves a little bit differently. So bring your legs to standing. So you'll have to be on your back, sorry, if I do this particular one. Bring your legs to standing. And again, this is where it's interesting because you all know what I mean by bring your legs to standing. And, you know, it's so funny when you first do it with a group of people and they do the most bizarre things <laughs> to bring their legs to standing, <laughs> their interpretation. Okay. So this sort of goes back a little bit to the first lesson we did. Just begin to roll a little left and right. Phil, where do you initiate that from? What's the first part of you that begins to roll across the ground? So you're rolling a little left and right. And what's the first part? What's in your image? Is it your legs and pelvis that first begin to roll? Is it your shoulders? Is it your head? What's your image? What do you include in your image of yourself when I say roll a little left and roll a little right? <laughs> and then gradually begin to explore being able to initiate that from different parts of yourself, which is again what we did in that first lesson, that you could initiate this rolling to the left and right from your head and see how much is ready to go along. You could initiate this from your shoulders Or you could initiate it from your pelvis and legs. So within this very simple movement, you have the opportunity to get a real sense of which parts of me are more in my image, which parts of me are ready 
to go, ready to move. What's the part of me that allows more of myself to come along? So begin now to move it, begin it from your pelvis. Choose the easiest side. So I've already asked you, there's already a lot, but I've already asked you to process information there. From rolling left and right, you're now going to choose the easiest side to begin to roll. So whichever side is easier, you go over that side. Feeling how the movement flows through you. The shift of weight. And where does your head go to follow that? So if in the Feldenkrais Method, one of the things we're really looking for is this really clear distinction or this ability to really sense our pelvis knows our head and our head knows our pelvis in many, many different ways. So as you begin, as you continue to roll your hips, your pelvis, your legs to the side that's easy, what are the different ways you could allow your head to follow that? So could you explore, and this is our favourite, at least three different ways of allowing your head to follow the movement of your pelvis? So it could roll a little in the same direction or the opposite direction. Maybe you tend to, as you do this, your chin moves closer to your chest or your chin might go away from your chest. Maybe one ear comes closer to one shoulder. So could you just explore some of these options and get a sense they might not be familiar to you, but you're exploring this relationship between how I roll my pelvis and legs to the side and where my head could go. And your eyes can be soft. And if you were just simply going to keep following that movement, could you come up to sitting? So now you've processed some information, you've looked for some relationships. Now you're having to apply it into a movement. You're going to keep moving your pelvis and legs to the one side and see if you can find a way that that could bring you up to sitting. So that your head is always responding to the movement of your pelvis. And notice how you do that. So your pelvis is driving the movement and your head is just responding, it's going along for the ride. And maybe there's different ways that you could let your head respond as you come up to sitting. 
Maybe it could extend or turn or side bend. And really feel as you come up to sitting, as you're finding your way to come up. What's your sense of how you feel in sitting when you've allowed your pelvis to lead the movement and your head to follow? and have a rest. Is that a way that you might normally maybe choose to roll out of bed in the morning? So maybe when you go to roll out of bed tomorrow morning, there might be a moment when you could think, how do I do that? How do I do this thing I do every morning? Is this the side that I roll to? This do I did I am I rolling to the side that is actually easiest for me? Or do I usually have to roll to the other side because I don't know, maybe my partner likes the other side of the bed or <laughs> don't want to roll over the top of them <laughs> to find my way. Bend your knees again. And now could you find your way, a way for your head to begin to lead this movement of rolling to the side? So it's now your pelvis, you're looking for how does my pelvis follow my head? And again, you might notice if you get to a point where you're rolling or you're turning, rounding, and your head gets to a point where it can't go any further, you get a little stuck. If you change your head position, still leading from your head, would you just change the direction of your head a little bit? Maybe you allow it to keep turning, maybe you side bend it a little. And does orienting your head in a slightly different direction influence how you come up to sitting? So Leah was doing this beautiful one before. She was coming up and looking up. <laughs> no? Do you want to do it again? It was gorgeous. So you rolled your pelvis first, but then you took your head up and kept coming up. Look how that's going to influence how she comes up to sitting because of where her head's going, the shape she's going to make, because everything has to understand now how to follow her head. And developmentally, this is more advanced <laughs> for us to begin orienting somewhere with our head and for that to lead us into movement. How do you come up, how do you feel about yourself when your head's led the movement when you come up? Which one might you use, your head or your pelvis? So if you're sort of lying in bed in the morning, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I have to get up few things to do. 
maybe how would you get up if you've, if you've already got your list that you're orienting to of what has to be done? <laughs> Is there something different in your intention <laughs> that organises what you do? <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with having an intention if it's really clear. Huh? But can you feel these two ways of getting up really evoke different ways of bringing you into the world? <laughs> so you're on your back again. And this time you're going to lead with your pelvis. Heads soft and responsive, just following along. And this time you're going to come all the way up to standing. And your pelvis is leading and your head's following. It's just simply, you're not oriented to anything in particular in the outside world. And how would your day begin from here? <laughs> Is this a place that you might normally begin your day? A place maybe you'd like to begin your day from? And then you can go down again and lead with your head with a more of an intention. That your head is leading. I'm going somewhere. Now, would that take you into your day? So these are sort of some of the sort of relationships that we're trying to make for people. Giving them options, making them aware of their habits, including more parts of themselves in their image. And that's a really simple one, you know, that you can begin to do. There was this really, um, I can't remember the, the thing, but there was the X lesson yesterday, you know, and you start off with the periphery moving you and you're using the periphery to mobilise the middle and bring it to life, to find the middle. So, you know, what, how could you use that in your normal life? What would that be useful for? So when's it, if I'm up in standing, when... What happens if I mobilise myself from my middle? What happens if I'm thinking more of my hands and feet? What's the state that takes me into? Which one's about being more in the world? Which one's about having a bit more space and a few more options? And So come up to standing, leading with your head or with your pelvis. <laughs> so how is it that we really begin to understand this fundamental relationship about my pelvis knowing my head and my head knowing my pelvis? <laughs> that they're not two separate parts of me, but they support each other and... My organisation is dependent on them really knowing, me knowing in my image that they're related to each other. So if you began to walk now and initiate it from your pelvis. So your head's just responding. It's just going along for the ride. <laughs> And most of you will feel this is a very familiar feeling often at the end of an ATM. <laughs> this ability where we've given up 
some of the clear intentionality in our actions that I've got to, this is, so can you feel this is not for many of us a place where it's like, oh, I've got to go and do the shopping, I've got to organise dinner, I've got to, <laughs> but maybe there's a way that I could think about that I've got to do the shopping and I can organise the kids to do this and that I could keep a little bit of this feeling with as I'm doing it. Hmm. And then maybe for some of us, the opposite, when it's very difficult to really galvanise myself into action. <laughs> and if you let your head now lead. How's this different? If you're more oriented and you've got a clear orientation with your head about where you're going in space. <sighs> but your pelvis is still absolutely under there to support it, to carry, to do the work. Okay. So just break into little groups of three and just have a little talk about what was your experience from that. 